So when you set a personal goal, you break a barrier. It's just not about you. Wow. It's like the people around you as well. It gives them permission, like an unspoken permission to break their own barriers. That's one of the greatest things that comes out of any accomplishment. It's, it's just not about you. Joining me today is legendary coach and the original Ultimate Runner competition champion, Larry Weber. Larry's ahead of the game in many facets as a head coach. He views each athlete as unique and provides insights in this interview on the dangers of system-based thinking. He has taken women who have never run competitively and helped assist them to Olympic qualifiers. He has coached high school state champions and successfully trained himself to win one of the most intense running competitions in the world. There are many great insights on this one, and I hope you guys enjoy. This episode is sponsored by MindSport, the number one meditation app for athletes. In the flow station today, we have Larry Weber, uh, a legend in the street, so I've heard. Thank you for coming on. Hey, it's just awesome to be here today. A lot of fun. <laughs> um, just to start it off, tell me a little bit about your journey to get into to running and then obviously the, the crazy event that you later got into. Sure. I started running when I was uh, real young. I was 10 years old and I uh, ran all the way through high school. Um, I was a state champion in high school uh, back in the day. It was the 880 meters, 800 meters. And then from there, I went to the University of Montana, ran Division One. And then after um, college, I ran for Reebok. Uh, I ran for them and a couple other clubs, uh, uh, Reebok Shoe Company as well. You were one of the first sponsors for Reebok, There was right? some of that, yeah. It wasn't a great sponsorship by, yeah. back then, you know, like there is now. Uh, we were thrilled to get shoes and equipment, and, and there were some prize money races. And just to get <laughs> prize money at that time was something else. So oh, yeah. to win, that was, that was a big deal back then. For sure. And then you got into this crazy race which you know i'm maybe a lot of people haven't heard of it but one of the craziest races that i've ever read up on and, and just go into that journey sure. and, and what is what it's about sure yeah i was a national class uh, runner in terms of uh, 1500 meters in the mile and they had a race during that time um, to determine what they believed to be the best all run in the world and one of the races that was in it was the 10K, the 400 meter. Another one was 400 meters, the 100 meters, the mile, and the marathon. And so there was an argument going around. Who's the, a better runner? Who's the best in the world? A miler, a marathon runner, an ultra marathoner? So some of the best runners in the world, the American record holder at 50 miles, um, number three ranked uh, ultra runner in the world was there. Olympians over the years at 1,500 meters, 5,000 meters, the marathon. Um, competed in the event so it was a crazy race and it's yeah. like r the running decathlon or much like the triathlons uh, and it started out during that same time period and they thought it would take off like um, the triathlons like the iron man and uh, it it lasted for several years but it was a brutal race and very very difficult um, to run all those races in one day but um, that was the essence of it to determine the best all-around runner and uh, Basically, you know, was it a miler? Was it a marathon? Or was it an ultra guy who could who could score the most points in an event? It was it was set up like a decathlon where there's points for each event. Mm. And so you 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 won that, correct? I won it. Yeah, I won the race overall, and I set the all time record with in the ultimate runner, and and the record was never broken. So wow. I was just really blessed and fortunate um, to win that race. It was it was a great time. It was one of the toughest things I've I've ever done. It was for me at the time like climbing Mount Everest, you know, doing all those races and training for yeah. that event. It was very, very challenging, and I learned so many life lessons from that, that yeah. event. Yeah, and one thing I would be interested to hear is just, like, what was your mental prep before, like, the night before when you know you're about to go into this event? Like, what were you thinking? What were you preparing for? How did you How did you really set yourself up for that race? Sure. One of the things, I think, in any event, any athletic event, you have to really think through – uh, that competition and you know, visualize what you're going to do. So I actually walked through each event. So how do you prepare for something you've never done before? I had never even run a marathon before. That that was my really? first, yes, that was my first ever marathon. Wow. So I trained really hard um, for you know a year for that event, but just walking through, uh, visualizing each race, and just uh, you know making sure that I paced myself. Because I remember running it, and again, there was a guy that ran a 212 marathon the year before. It was pretty fast in the marathon, and and just, you know, can I stay with that guy? You know, where can I make my move in the marathon? There was an Olympian running the 1,500 meters. You know, can I stay with him, and how can I stay with him? So there was a lot of race strategy going on in my mind, 
And then really one of the keys to that whole race was pacing myself. We have a tendency sometimes to get too excited, I guess, in running and go out too hard. So I really thought through the pacing of that event as well. So when you do one of the events, how long do you have to rest between? Actually, it started off with a 10K, a 10-kilometer race. Gotcha. So you had an hour rest, and then you went into the 400 meters. So you're running at your lactate threshold level, basically. Then all of a sudden, you're running full out. So it's quite the transition uh, from running a 10K to a 400-meter race. Yeah. And so when you get that hour rest, what's what's the mental preparation there? Are you, are you just trying to regather your, your breath? Yes. And, you know, it's like anything else in life. You never want to get ahead of yourself. So you just stay focused on that particular event. You tune out all distractions. You focus on the goal and the task at hand. And that was so true within the context of that event. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot think ahead of you just, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah. it's just staying focused on the goal at that time and then you know moving to the next race after that and then really thinking through the strategy as well you know mentally and what you're going to do that was really critical in that race and so i've heard you you trained yourself for this race i did and, yeah. and what was the reason for that i was a little frustrated um i always thought i had more potential uh, than i did and i was at the end of my career and i was at the i ran into the usa championships in the 1500 meters and you know, I did okay, you know, but I, I thought I could do better than that. So I totally reorganized my training. I trained myself. And without getting into a lot of the technical details, the lactate threshold runs, I'd never even done one of those before, running at, at that level uh, before you, you know, start to accumulate lactic acid. I'd never done those, just at that edge. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I tr just really retrained um, basically uh, myself and how – to get through that particular race because you have to have speed and strength. Got you. And I was just blessed, you know, to beat these guys who I'd never beaten before. I'd never had, I wasn't even on the radar for that race. Um, I didn't have the name recognition of these guys. And uh, it was it was a little bit intimidating, imitate, intimidating going in, mm -hmm. but um, it was it was a great, great event. And just, uh, you know, it was a, it was a good time and, um, and I really had to come up with my own training plan because there was no um, yeah, there's no blueprint. blueprint. Right? Yeah. There's no blueprint uh, because you had to be fast. I was training 100 miles a week, um, which isn't uh, a lot of miles for you know world class marathoners. It might be 120, 140. But then I would train down a little bit prior to only 80 miles a week. Let's say 70 miles before I ran, you know, to develop a little more speed. So there was no blueprint. So I had to create my own blueprint. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And, you know, what, what does it take mentally in terms of the belief in yourself to do something that is so outside of the box and, and, and so difficult? I think you have to be willing to take a risk, uh, risks in life. And, you know, uh, my faith really played into that. The scripture, Philippians 4.13, became my life first after that, that. I really believed I had strength from the Lord in that race. And that has been the context of my life ever since. That belief, deep belief um, in your God-given ability is really critical because you can say you believe, but then you have to internalize. It has to go from here to here, from the head to the heart. So that is so important. And I feel like that was the first time I really had that sort of uh, uh, confidence. Wow, yeah. in my so it was a life changer for me. It was a game changer for mm -hmm. me going through that and that belief. And it's carried on in other areas of my life since that time. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you'd think that running at a national class level, you'd have that, that deep confidence. I really didn't until that race. That race really changed things for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's quite interesting because, you know, you think about all the work you put in and then just for, for it to finally come through at that moment is, is, is interesting, man. And we have so much more distractions now. And you talked about that in your race. If you get distracted at all, you're, you're done. You know, you, you can't look ahead. You can't focus on, you know, what you just ran. You got to wait, you got to rest, you got to recover and go after what, what's next. Um, as you become a coach or, you know, even if you could put yourself in the shoes of runners now or athletes now, how would you think you'd buffer the distractions we have with our phones, with social media, with all the things that we have in our way? That's an excellent question. And I do coach a lot and I've coached for, for many years now, but there are so many distractions out there. But I think when you build a strong community, I think it takes the place of those distractions. I was recently at a camp 
where in fact that's a great question because uh, one of the parents took a picture of the, of the kids that I was helping and they were sitting around talking in community rather than on their cell phones. And she, there was a caption just like that. Hey, they're really, they're doing something other than their cell phones. That's cool. They're connecting. Yeah. They're talking. Um, and they're, and we're building community. So that is really important, you know, to have Huge. that personal touch yeah. and to build that community and whatever you're doing. It, it's so important within the context of, you know, any area of life. And especially coaching is building that community. Yeah. And it's huge. Yeah. And, and that kind of takes the place of those other, if you will, distractions. Yeah. When you build community like that. So so you being a coach now and, and you having this deep faith and, and, and actual motivation to build community, um, how have you seen, and not, not trying to bag on other coaches, but how have you seen a difference between guys who really focus on building up a team through community and taking full responsibility for these kids and really loving them uh, as a person versus people who just kind of, you're the next up, you're the next up. I'm going to answer that really directly. Kids see through it. They know if you care or not, they can see through it. Kids are smart. And, you know, I think everything uh, starts with really loving those kids. I actually wrote a little article on that and how important that is. Uh, to love those kids and gave the illustration of a teacher. They did a, a story one time and it always has stuck with me about these kids. They became um, professionals in, uh, let's say, banking. Um, in their, They became highly successful in their churches. They were attorneys. They became extremely successful, this one class. And they tracked down the teacher of these kids. They It all came back down to one teacher and they were asking her questions like, um, you know, was it your curriculum? You know, was it something in the classroom that you did that was way different on an educational standpoint for all these kids to be successful? And her response has always stuck with me, always stuck with me. I just love those kids. That was it. Everything starts with that. And kids, kids know, you know, how engaged you are. Um, not to judge anyone on that, but, you know, they know if you're engaged and you're trying to help them. That story has always stuck with me, mm-hmm. and I've tried to to really uh, use that in my own coaching career. You know, every child is different. Yeah, and uh, we customize plans just like you would in education. You, for coaching, you customize. Um, one size does not fit all. And to me, that's love and action. When you're yeah. taking the time, it's love and action. When you're trying to, and you never do it perfectly, and I certainly haven't, uh, but that's always the goal is to customize to the unique requirements and the unique gifts of each individual. That yeah. is so key, so key. Yeah. So go into that a little bit, is having a system as a coach and what's comfortable for you versus, hey, I gotta look at this kid and, and figure out what's the best for him sure. down the line. How much more work is that? It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work and think about it. You know, One size does not fit all. You can't have a standard template for everybody's DNA is different. Uh, it's just not the physical part of coaching. It's the mental and spiritual parts of coaching, too. And how are you going to reach, you know, an individual to help them reach their God-given potential? How are you going to do that? So it requires work. And rather than having one single plan uh, for each individual, you need to talk. You need to listen to kids. You need to listen to their heart um, and ask questions, see what motivates them, as you all know, um, it's everybody's motivation is different. So finding something that is really important to them and seeing, letting them see how, you know, let's say running, because I coach running, connects to their goals. So connecting some goal to their running, I think is so important. And the only way you can do that is to customize to each person because every motivation is different for each athlete. That's, that's interesting, man. As I went through college basketball, a lot of my focus was to how to figure out how to bring back intrinsic motivation for myself and not have as many external goals right. as I was going through the journey. Is that something you try to you, t- you try to tailor their motivations to or do you think there's a value in, a, in some external motivation either from you know friends, family or, or I, anything else? I think I can answer that in a couple of different ways. I think um, it's a process. If you, if you have a good process in place for each individual, the outcome will take care of itself, you know. So I basically, you, know, you go to work every day, you you train every day, you do the things you need to do, and whatever that outcome is, um, 
you know, it'll take care of himself. Let's say a state championship or something. I think if you do the work and you have that kind of ability and you come to practice each day, yeah, you work your individual plan and don't focus so much on that outcome mm. goal. Focus mm -hmm. more on the process of getting there. I think that's really, really good too. I think the other thing that uh, is really important is not to have your whole identity in athletics either and to make sure that there is other other things that are in each individual's life, especially kids, so their identity is not just wrapped up around sport. I think that relieves the pressure, yet you go for you know, your very best, absolutely, but your identity is not wrapped up in it either. You know, that, that's, that's a challenge um, to make sure that that doesn't happen because someday the playing career is gonna be over. And some people have struggled with that. So yeah. it's something that, you know, I've tried to focus on and be uh, aware of in, in making sure that kids have, you know, well balanced, but work hard. And that's saying you have to, if you're gonna go for your uh, goal, you have to work hard, but trying to be balanced in what they're doing as well. Yeah, I think that's that's huge because, and I almost think it's almost cliche now. Like, oh, don't I, don't your identity is not in sports. It's not. This is not who you are. And I think, it, like you said, you can have the head knowledge, but it's got to come to your heart. And so, for me, as I've transitioned, I would have liked to say that my identity wasn't in basketball. But the way that I was training and the, my emotional reactions after games or practices would say otherwise. You know, I had the head knowledge. Like, no, I'm not a basketball player, but you know, my reactions and how much I trained, it almost seemed like if you can't relax, if you can't just be okay, yeah, you, you're too tied up in the game. And I think, do, do you feel like having that separation allows for the deepest relaxation and freedom for the athletes? I think so too. And I think, let's, let's talk about a practical example of that. Uh, it's important, let's, let's use teenagers, for example, mm -hmm. to really help them academically so they have, a, they have life in academics. So you really encourage that. You encourage other parts. You have to be intentional, intentional uh, with the people you coach. Encourage that so they are more well-balanced. And then, you know, uh, one of the things we do in our summer programs is we have Fourth of July runs. We have ice cream runs for high school. We have a lot of fun things, too, so it's not just all work and no play. So it's that kind of balance, and that's that's a good way to build community, to do other things like that um, as well, but to actively encourage other areas other than just athletics. I think it makes you know a much more uh, well-rounded person, and uh, so it's not just about who's winning today. Mm -hmm. You know, um, sure, it's good to go after championships. It's good to go all the after those things, but at the end of the day, the career is going to be over someday. And so it's good to have diverse interests and encourage those interests and be intentional about it as yeah. a coach. It's important. And, and I don't want to gas you too much, but just so people know how good of a coach you are, talk about the story of you just taking, you know, women who were not runners and, and almost qualifying them for the Olympics. Well, there was uh, one lady named Susan Havens. Um, she's from the Olympia area and Olympia, Washington area. And she had never run in high school, never run in college, and uh, we worked together. And uh, she actually uh, qualified for the U.S. Olympic trials and ran in the trials at around age 40 years of age. But she had never participated in running. Um, and That's she qualified crazy. for the Olympic trials, you know, in the marathon. She was ranked um, the top, I don't know, 15, 16 in the world in different masters events as well um, at one time. But she was, she was an amazing, you know, she was a hard worker and just really did it, um, you know, well. And then uh, I coached another young lady named uh, Linda Hike for 22 years, still, still helping her. And um, we were at the track one day and she ran in high school, didn't run in college. And uh, she ended up qualifying for the U.S. Olympic trials too. And, in the marathon and it's become one of the best masters runners around as That's well. That's crazy. Yeah, she's, she uh, again didn't run, didn't run in college, but um, yeah, she did really well. Hard worker. To, to go into more of the psychology behind how you coach and how you, um, how you got into your space of flow for you back in the day, obviously it's more than just the physical stuff. You know, we all go through a bunch of training, especially when you go into those races you were talking about there was great athletes that you were going against and you're trying to strategize, okay, how do I, how do I compete with these guys, right? right. Um, how do you get yourself to let go of the training that you did and, and to really trust that moment in the event versus just get tighter as the event comes? We have a great expression in the world of running, the hay is in the barn. 
<laughs> great expression. You've done all the work. It's uh, it's an old metaphor. We, you've done the work. Uh, it's done. You're ready um, to reap the benefits of what you've done. So you you just have to trust that you had the right training. You've you've done the work and have a strong belief that you've done everything you can to prepare. And if if you feel that way. You know, training is important. You, you can't you can't fool yourself. You you have to work hard and smart, not just hard, but smart, which means rest at times. Um, so that really helps with the belief going into a race. But as far as just coaching is concerned, to me, the hardest part of coaching is not the technical aspects. It's not learning how to peak an athlete. It's not learning, um, you know, all the technical. It doesn't matter what sport it is. You know, to me, it's g helping that individual believe in themselves and their God-given ability. To me, that's the toughest part because it's everybody's different in, in where they're at in terms of their belief and their, their skill levels and, you know, their gifts. So I spent a lot of time on that, a lot of time on that. And that ultimate runner changed my whole paradigm in life and what's possible, what's possible. You know, it was hard to run one race at one time, but running five of those races in one day, you can do more than you initially believe. You you definitely can, and everybody can. It's just tapping into that. It's tapping into that extra something, you know, to to reach your goals. And it's there for everybody. I mean, physiologically, they've done studies. They've done all kinds of studies on this in terms of you know we don't really get to our potential. There's always more you can go, I and mean, it's tapping into that. And, so I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out in my coaching career, how to tap into the little extra in each person. And how do you do that in a way that's not degrading to them, where you're just like, you can go harder, and just you run harder, and just screaming at them? Is, is there, is that the where the skill comes into play? I think I think you set small achievable steps. Mm -hmm. I think that really helps. You don't set a goal to go out and run a state, uh, be a state champion the first day. You set a milestone. I think there's milestones along the way where, okay, let's just finish a race. Let's just say somebody's starting out. Okay, now let's set a time of, you know, if you're a 5K runner, 5K runners will get this. Let's start, set a time of 25 minutes for 5K. And then let's set a time of 22. Let's set a time of 21. Because everybody at first wants to go from, you know, nothing to, you know, this great time or this great, um, performance. It doesn't happen that way. Everything takes time. It does. So setting uh, milestones along the way is mission critical, I think, um, to, to accomplishing a bigger goal. So I think there's two sides of belief. Um, there's the belief in yourself and your ability and pursuing that. I think, though, I love the story of Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister was the first man to ever break a four-minute mile. And no one had ever done that before, and no one really thought he could. It hadn't been done for hundreds of years. So he, it was a big issue. You know, can we, can we really break a four-minute mile? Mm -hmm. And he, he had the belief, the deep belief in himself to do that. And no one had done, uh, broken that four-minute mile. But I guess the question is, was that the greatest, was that his greatest accomplishment? I would argue no, that wasn't his greatest accomplishment. He broke the barriers for other people. That belief barrier was broken after he ran a sub four minute mile. Within 10 years, 336 other individuals broke a four minute mile. So when you set a personal goal, you break a barrier. It's just not about you. Wow. It's like the people around you as well. It gives them permission, like an unspoken permission to break their own barriers. So that's the part of synergy on a team. When somebody breaks a personal record or a personal goal, it opens the gateway for others to follow. That's one of the greatest things that comes out of any accomplishment. It's, it's just not about you. Think of it as you think, you know, the scripture would be Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh, so is he. Well, science is just catching up with that right now because you can redirect your thoughts. I mean, that's the whole thing you have to do is be able to learn to do that. You know, I'm not thinking about something negative, but you know, whether it's for me, it's the scripture and, and taking something more positive and being very intentional about that and teaching kids to do that. So when they're feeling X, you direct them to Y, which is a more positive thought. But it's work. It's like, it's just as hard work as the physical training. And a lot of people don't want to do that. And if you look at scripture and you look what science is saying, 
they they correspond. I'm very much that way too. I very much have a science mind, but I very much have a super strong belief in God too. You know, I've, I've done my research. I've done all that. And um, but what's interesting is the correlation is beginning to, to happen in that neurogenesis field. So I study the brain. I study so with my wife. She's into brain development and all that. So we study all that, and we work with the kids to, to change, you know, think about what you're thinking about is a big deal. Mm-hmm. A lot of thoughts going through there all day long. Yeah. <laughs> Very thinking good thoughts and directing them t- to the goal. For sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, for sure. But it's very intentional to do that. Yeah. So we work with kids, and that's what we're working on at camp. And it goes back to that belief again. So I, I think that's where I've tried to understand. I, I studied a lot of different meditation techniques, and the one thing I've tried to understand is the balance between not resisting or fighting certain thoughts, but also redirecting it towards something positive. Like, is there a fine line for you in yeah, that there way? Is, there is. And There's branches in your brain. So it takes 21 days to basically detox your brain of, a, let's say, a bad thought, something that's not good for you, whether it's, let's say, a woman's in an abusive relationship or picks bad guys mm-hmm. and wants to get over that. It really takes the branches in your brain, actually, it takes 21 days to detox it, and you have to reinforce it you know, the, a better thought, you know, for that period of time as well. And those branches literally disintegrate and new ones in the brain they're finding are, are developed. Think of a branch. So you're growing new branches mm. by changing your thought. It's that powerful. It wow. really is. Yeah, no, it is. It's that powerful. But in the brain itself, there are actual changes that happen in, in when a new positive thought or hope is put in the, in your brain. Wow, Yeah. That's, and, that's and why the breaking of the barrier is big, right? That right. is. That's why the breaking of the barriers is big because that's changing other people's thoughts yeah. too. 336, and it hasn't been done since the history of mankind. What's up with that? It's crazy. What's up with that? Yeah. So I think one of the things that uh, we can learn from each other, whether it's basketball, uh, whether it's running, I think one of the things is to learn from other sports. For example, in, in running, uh, there's a guy named Dr. Jack Daniels, and he's – uh, called America's Best Coach, and he observed in swimming something called cruise intervals where swimmers would take short breaks, short rests uh, in their workouts, and they were going at a moderate effort, let's say like 80%. Well, he adapted that to the running world, and now we, we do what's called cruise intervals. You know, he coined that term, and that's really helped distance runners improve over the years. So I think it's important to see if there's something um, that you can take from another uh, sport as well. It's kind of a systems approach to learning outside the context of your sport. Can you do that? Another simple illustration would be in cross country. Like I'll try and get the basketball players to come out uh, for cross country so they can um, you know, do better in their sport, basketball, so they're better conditioned going into the season. I think we can learn outside of our, our sports you know, as well. And something that's really important, I wrote an article a while back about systems thinking and how um, sometimes you'll read in a running magazine, well, you need to do this speed work and you'll get better, or you need to do you know, a long distance run to get better. Well, no, it's all of those things. You need to put them in context. Uh, and taking a systems approach, that's one of the challenges in some of the articles that are out there. Um, it's not just one thing that's gonna make you better, it's multiple things within you know, your, your fitness system. So I think that's really important to look at, um, even to the point of if you're a coach, you know, having a great athletic trainer in your sport, a physical therapist in your sport, you know, a conditioning coach, really uh, being careful on how, who you pick and who you have in that program. So you need that as far as your systems thinking. It's not just about your coaching for your sport, but who are those people you're going to bring in to help, you know, those, those individuals reach their potential as well that you're coaching. So I think that's really important is to have those other systems and processes in place to support your core coaching, whether it's in basketball or running or swimming or whatever the sport is. Who are those people that can help you in your, in your sport as well outside of your expertise? Yeah, man. So just to close it out, I always ask my guests to, to give one challenge for the viewers. Um, and I mean, you've hit a bunch on belief and belief in yourself and breaking barriers that you know, it might not have to be a four minute mile, but it could just be something that you're struggling with or a smaller thing. Um, what would be one challenge that you've, you felt like you've gone through in your life that you could share, you know, offer a, a goal for somebody 
out there. It could be small, it could be big, um, but just a challenge that they can work on in the next week or, or in the next year. Boy, everybody is so different. I, I guess I would go back to belief that if, if you've had a struggle, whether it's you know with a diet, a nutrition, I would just encourage you to, whatever cha- your challenge is in life, is to give it one more chance and to really, really um, set your mind and internalize you know, the belief that you can overcome that challenge, whatever that challenge is. It's pretty generic, but uh, I have seen it happen time after time. I've seen, I've talked to kids, for example, that didn't think they could become state champions or they didn't believe that. I'd say 80% of the people that made, you know, that have helped with the Olympic trials, let's say, they didn't believe they could do it at first. I'd say 80% of the people who were state champions are at that level. They didn't believe it. So save yourself some time and find a way to really you know, believe in your God uh, given ability and go do it. I love it, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was a, an honor to have you on, and I look forward to following you in the coaching world and, and seeing how you guys do this year. All right. Thank you so much. I wanted to give another quick shout out to my sponsor, MindSport. MindSport is a meditation app made specifically for athletes. If you want to improve your performance on and off the court, lower your stress levels, learn the foundations of meditation and yoga, and improve your quality of sleep, this app is for you. Make sure to give it a download in the iTunes App Store, and we'll see you in the next video.